Uh, do you, anybody have any questions about what we were doing the other day? Yes. Yes, what did we do? Uh, what did we do? Uh, well, uh, I tapped the board inadvertently several times when the board wasn't working. Uh, and we, we finished talking about supply and we graphed it and we put supply and demand together. And when we put supply and demand together, we end up coming up with this magical equilibrium point. Equilibrium means balance. At this point, the price that we wanted, we're willing to pay, $3 is equal to the price that they're charging. At this point, you know that green stuff that just came up. Uh, but at this price, uh, let me rephrase that. At this price, at $3, the amount that we're willing to buy, you know, all of the demand curve, is this. And at this price, $3, According to the supply curve, how much are they willing to make? 80. So at this price, $3, we're in balance. The amount that you and I are buying is equal to the amount that they're making. So we ain't wasting. We're not producing stuff that we can't sell and have to throw it away. But we're producing everything that everybody wants so you don't have customers banging on the door saying, you know, I want more, I want more, gimme, gimme, gimme. Or I'm gonna set car on fire. Right. So this is sort of where the balance is, and we sort of talked about if the price ends up being too high. If your price is too high and you're making a bunch of stuff and you can't sell it, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna probably throw, maybe you have to throw some of it away, but the other thing you can do, you're gonna lower your price and you're gonna cut back the amount you produce, right? And yet, if your price is so low that you sell out first thing in the morning every day and you, you keep running out, well, one of the things you're gonna do is raise your price because you have to raise your price to allow you to produce the extra that the customers want. So you can buy more ovens, refrigerators, delivery trucks, chainsaws, bullets, whatever it is you've got to buy. So if the price is too low, it's going to get raised. If the price is too high, it's going to get lowered until we end up, we're not perfectly there, but we're going to be in the ballpark of equilibrium for most products. And then I had that little dirty little asterisk, unless the government screws around, that we'll come to later to that. And then, I'm not trying to pick out a star, but it's good that you, you asked that question and weren't here, so I can review everybody else. So then we ended class, whatever that day was, Tuesday, um, talking about, well, we know our tastes and preferences change over time. Our income might change. We get a pay raise, we get, you know, those determinants of demand might change. Also, the determinants of supply might change. The price of sugar, the price of flour, the price of chainsaws, the price of gasoline might change, and that's gonna impact the company's ability to produce. So then we started going through the, well, what happens in each of those four situations? If demand increases, something happens that makes us want more, well, we're gonna buy more and the price is gonna get higher. We get this new equilibrium point here. I'm a little bit doing this for the people that were online watching at home, they couldn't see. So this equilibrium point doesn't exist anymore because this doesn't exist anymore. We have this new reality. And so at that point, prices are higher, we buy more. Where the next combination, the next possibility is, well, what happens if something decreases our demand? We find out that this product will, I don't know, make us sick, will kill us, will make our lips fall off, I think is what I had happen. Well, we're less interested in buying it, so we're gonna buy it less and they're gonna lower their price to try to keep all of us from leaving, to so slow some, slow some of us down from running out of the door. The third possibility, the third thing we looked at was, well, what happens if something happens to make it easier for the company to produce? If the price of bullets is cheaper, the price of bulldozers is cheaper, the price of ovens is cheaper, refrigerators is cheaper, it makes it easier for them to produce. So they're going to make more, but they're going to lower their price because if they don't lower their price, it's easier to do. So you're going to be asking for somebody else to come in and do it too, because it's easier to do. Hey, I couldn't do it before, but hey, now I can because it's cheaper, because it's easier, whatever. <laughs> so to kind of take away that incentive for extra competition, the price is going to go down. 
And then the fourth combination was what happens if something happens to make it hard for business to do business? Like the price of gasoline goes up, trade tariffs with China, things like that. What would happen that would end? Well, uh, we'll take an asterisk on that trade tariff thing. Um, tariffs hit in two places, and we'll talk about that one in a little bit, this trade war. Um, Actually, somebody remind me in a few minutes. I get, I'm going to come back to that. Um, but in my mind, I've got to work out. There, there, there's two, two things. I've got to figure out which of the two is going to happen at the same time, and I'm pretty sure I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Okay. I'll get to it when I get to it. Okay. Uh, so the fourth thing, it, it's harder for business to do things, so it's going to cost them more money to produce. So they're going to raise their prices, pass that cost on to us, and then the higher prices, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to buy less of them. So... That's where we were in the end of class Tuesday. And I was like, I will give you on the test the supply curve and the demand curve so you can work things out and see if you can't figure it out. If you can't logically, well, what would I do if I was leaving? All my customers were fleeing my store while I might try to lower my price. If you can't logic it out, I'll give you a supply and demand curve so you can draw it out. Or if you're just good at memorizing, congratulations, and you can memorize this slide here that gives you the results from those four possibilities. So that's where we were too set. Now let's complicate things because the world is complicated. Just like some of y'all's what Facebook relationship status, right? Okay. Do they still have that it's complicated? Okay. Yeah. Yes. I haven't been on Facebook for years, so I got away. I got out, I got back in, and then I got back out. The only reason I got in the second time is because I was using Facebook as a tool in the class for project the students were using, and then once that semester was over, I burned it down as fast as possible. Really? Do I need the updates of the, yeah, I just had a great workout today. Oh, I'm going to go and eat lunch with my BFF. And, oh, I had a great lunch with my BFF, and here's a picture of my whatever pasta salad. I, really? Just, yeah. And then to be looking at some of the people that I went to high school with uh, from 20 some odd years ago that um, uh, they didn't age very well. So moving right along. So, anyway. I digress. But Facebook is a wonderful thing if y'all like Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> y'all y'all don't do Facebook, Snapchat anymore, right? Y'all moved on. Instagram, is that where y'all are? No, Snapchat is probably the biggest one. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. My space or oh 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 oh, it, it, oh crap! I can't remember that old website thing from way back in the day. Oh, hey, well, uh, yeah. Geo sites? No. Um, crap. Because I had a CompuServe account. That was even before AOL. So, and somewhere at the house, I think I have my username written down somewhere. Anyway, it's gone. So, the world is a complicated place. So what happens if two things happen at the same time? What was the product that we were talking about the other day? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oopsie, with that, with that umlaut, is that what they call it? Yeah, so we're, we're getting a little bit of Oopsie. <laughs> It's as brown as your beer, yes. And Guinness. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so what happens if something happens that makes it easier for the company to produce at the same time that you and I decide we want more of it? We want more Pepsi because we find out we read the somebody's Instagram feed that talks about how drinking Pepsi makes you smarter and faster and better looking. So you're like, hey, I want more of that. At the same time, the price of sugar and caramel coloring and stuff gets cheaper. What's going to happen there? So the well, we, lines are going to shoot. Okay. Is it a, you, we got a supply <coughs> thing and a demand thing, right? Because it's a supply issue because we don't know. We ain't got a clue about the price of caramel coloring, right? But okay, it makes it easier for business. So it's a supply thing. Demand thing is about the way we feel about the product. We feel better about it because it does more for us and quench our thirst. So it's a supply thing, a demand thing, and are both of those good news? Yeah. 
that both of them are going to shift out to the right. You get a new demand curve out to the right, a new supply curve out to the right. Are you saying the same? We'll get there, maybe. The answer is, it depends. Either way, we want more, they can make more. There is no doubt about it, more is gonna happen. A lot more. Just the whole, if you build it, they'll come. Ben, you all seen that movie? If you build it, they'll come. <laughs> Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones. Late 80s. No, oh, your dad has on a videotape. Yes. Story. You don't have a VCR and <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway, it, it, it's it's a classic baseball movie. Okay. So anyway. and the dude mowed up part of the cornfield in order to put up a baseball field so the ghost of his daddy would come out and play ball with him. And and a bunch of major league dead whatever ghost. Okay. And the baseball classic like are buying a bunch of the zombies. No. Ooh. Oh, I'm gonna make a sequel. Oh, I'm gonna make a sequel. You know, Shoeless Joe Jackson. But I'm gonna make a sequel of it. It's called Field of Zombies. Yes. They're not ghosts. They're zombies. All right. I gotta get my mind off of it. So, more is going to be made. They're gonna make it because they can sell more, and they're gonna make more because it's easier to do. So more is going to get made. Well, what happens? The demand increase. Is going to make try to push the price up, but the supply increase is going to try to push the price down at the same time. So it, imagine two of y'all go out in the parking lot after class and y'all get in your trucks and you put them bumper to bumper and on the count of three y'all both match the gas. How many of you who has trucks in here? Matthew and. Oh, uh, um, we'll, we'll assume Connor did. He's not here to defend himself, so, okay. Luke sold his in order to buy drugs, so, okay. But then Kay came to class. Kay, do you drive a truck or a car? A car. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for another truck. Okay, right, so if Matthew goes out in his truck, Connor goes out in his truck, and they put him bumper to bumper, Matthew's got his matted, Connor has his matted, but how far are they traveling? Matter of inches, right? Could you push against each other? So, you know, the trucks are trying to go forward, but they ain't going forward because they're broke. But maybe, maybe one of them slowly starts pushing the other one away because one truck has better tires than the other that's getting slipped. Maybe one has got a stronger motor. It depends on how big the increase in supply is, how big the increase in demand is. It's going to dictate what happens to the price. Ultimately, we're not sure what happens to the price. It depends. But the one thing you can take to the bank is there will be a lot more made and there will be a lot more sold. That's the thing to take to the bank. Good. Let's theoretically. Um, let me get rid of this. What if, okay, Pepsi, you read in the newspaper that Pepsi will cure cancer, cure every disease known to humankind, make you faster stronger, smarter, better looking, smell better, able to fly, bulletproof. How much Pepsi are you going to be drinking? A lot. Right? Even those y'all are like, I've been only drinking bottled water since I was four years old. Y'all get start drinking Pepsi, right? Okay. So that's going to be a huge impact on our demand for Pepsi. Well, how about if the price of sugar goes up by one cent a ton? That's good for Pepsi, right? But is that a big deal? No. So in the case of the price of sugar goes, did I say up? I meant to say down. Okay. I mean, if the price of sugar goes down one cent a ton, so yeah, it's better for Pepsi, but what might you get there? It's a little itty bitty increase in supply there, right? And in that case, yeah, the price goes up. It just depends on how big the shift in demand is, how big the shift in supply is, it's gonna dictate what happens to the price. Maybe the price ends up being higher, maybe the price ends up being lower, maybe it ends up being about the same. We don't know. It just depends. 
But either way, the increase in price or the change in price that one of them is causing is going to be dampened by the change in price that the other one is causing. Think about the metaphor that I gave you in class the other day. I think I told you about you have a dragster with a parachute sticking out the back. The faster that dragster is going, the more air and wind resistance is going into the parachute, the more that parachute is trying to slow the car down, right? So the more this way you're getting, well, you're getting more this way. But yeah, the engine of the dragster is stronger than wind resistance of the parachute, so the car does keep going forward. Right. So that's, that's your metaphor. So whatever change in price that these two are dictating, it is going to be softened. It is going to be dampened. So on the test, the question is going to be, well, what happens if supply increases, demand increases? You can't answer about price. The answer I'm going to be looking for is quantity. And what happens? Goes up, right? We will buy more and they will make more. They can make more, they will make more, and they want to make more because they can sell more. And they're okay with that. I went from selling 2 million bottles at a dollar piece to $3 million at a bottle piece. I'm not getting more a bottle, but I'm selling a bunch more bottles. I'm fine with that. Because if I wasn't fine with that, I wouldn't have been making the first two million of them at a dollar a piece, right? So the companies are gonna be fine with this. And hopefully the, hopefully the demand increases, well. Yeah. What happens uh, yeah. if they increase, and they increase the supply at the same time, they don't change the price? This is gonna make a lot more profit. Yeah, in this situation here, they're, they're making 20 cents a bottle over 2 million bottles. Now they're going to make 20 cents profit a bottle over 3 million bottles. They've just increased their profit by 50%. So they're going to be perfectly fine with this. Does that make sense to you? I have a midterm report for you catch it at the end of class. So alternate universe number one. Well, this is the one where Spock was in charge of the enterprise. All in the universe number one. Let's see. This is a supply increase. Something makes it easier for Pepsi to produce. At the same time, customers say, I'm not as interested in your product as I was before. You got customers leaving, but it's easier for you to do the production. Pepsi makes you slower, dumber, and uglier, but the price of sugar and water and stuff is cheaper. So what's going to happen there? Supply increases, demand decreases. So one thing is going to make them want to make more, but the other thing is going to make us want to buy less. So what happens to the amount that gets bought and made? Well, here again, we're not sure. It is sort of the bad. But what are you going to see? A big drop in price. Because you have two things pushing the price down. Number one, well, we can push the price down because it's cheaper to produce. And number two, we've got to lower the price to keep from losing all our customers because customers are like, I ain't going to pay a dollar for something that's going to make me slower, dumber, and uglier. But maybe 75 cents, yeah, I might keep drinking. Right? You know, we kind of had that conversation. You know, how many of y'all drink beer? How many of y'all smoke? How many of y'all do tobacco? You know, just anyway. Ben, ben and Jerry's ice cream. I mean, y'all, y'all do this stuff. It kills you, right? But you eat it anyway, right? So, yes, Ben and Jerry's merchants of death. Right, you said it supply increase, demand increases. Supply increase, demand increases. That was the first one we did. Quantity goes up. In this case, one's going up, the other's going down. Price is going to drop. It's going to drop significantly. They can lower their price, and they have to lower their price, so you can end up with a big price drop. Alternate universe number two, Sulu, I think, was in charge of this enterprise in this alternate universe. I can't believe I remembered that. Okay, so in this case, supply decreases at the same time demand increases. We want more Pepsi, but it's harder for them to make Pepsi. So what happens there? We want more Pepsi. Demand increase because it makes it smarter and better looking. The demand is going to increase. It's going to shift out to the right, but at the same time, the supply is going to decrease. It's going to come back to the left. So what we get here is 
two things that are pushing the price higher. The price is going up because we want more of it, and they're going to take advantage of that. But then the price is going up because they have to raise price because the cost of sugar and flour and whatever is going up, right? So you're going to get a big increase in price. But here again, well, we're not quite sure what happens to quantity. It depends on how big the price change of the sugar and the salt and caramel coloring and bullets are. And it depends on just how smart and better looking and bulletproof you actually end up getting by drinking it. If you're only slightly bulletproof, that doesn't change you a whole lot. If you're super bulletproof, yeah. But y'all are under 25, so y'all all think you're bulletproof anyway, right? When I was y'all's age, I didn't have health insurance. <laughs> Not building houses. The smartest thing to do. I used to joke about if I got hurt on a job site, I'm like, if I got hurt on a job site, stick me in my truck so then I can charge it to my car insurance company. Okay. The fourth example, supply decreases the same time demand decreases. It's harder for Pepsi to make the product and customers are less interested in buying the product, less willing and less able to buy Pepsi. We don't want it, and it's harder for them to make it. This, my friends, is a nightmare scenario. You're losing customers left and right. The price, who knows? But you're gonna get a big decrease in the amount of Pepsi that gets sold. Big decrease. So we don't know about the price. Yeah. In this case, we don't know what's happening to price necessarily. Maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down. If that's for the, it depends thing. But you're going to get two things saying slow down. They're slowing down on their end. We're slowing down on our end. Double slow down. I have a graph, a, a, a slide. The next slide summarizes those four things. But I want to come back to two of them before I go there. Because I promised you. This, the tariff trade war thing that's going on right now is doing this. This is what we're getting with the trade war. Because we're raising tariffs on Chinese products. We're making stuff being shipped in from China more expensive. So that's going to decrease our demand. <clears throat> At the same time, what's happening? The stuff that we're getting from China is more expensive, so it's harder for us to buy the whatever Chinese-made components that we need to make the American-made products that we do. Where they don't do it anymore, but Motorola used to assemble their cell phones in Texas using parts that were made in China. So what do you end up getting here? Well, the parts that are coming from China are now more expensive for Motorola to put in a phone, right? So that's making it harder for Motorola to assemble their products, right? So it's harder for Motorola to assemble their products, so that's a supply decrease, but then I guess I really started to figure this, is the demand decrease is with this trade war, the Chinese customers aren't as willing to buy our products. The Chinese customers aren't willing, to, willing and interested in buying as many Motorola phones because those Motorola phones are more expensive. Or they're sitting there believing what the government is saying about American is evil, don't buy Motorola. <laughs> right? Buy a Huawei instead. Or uh, TCL. Or they're doing the same thing. So uh, Chinese are raising the price. Yeah. We're putting taxes on the products that they're shipping us. So they're adding taxes to the products that we're shipping them. So in either case, China is buying less American products. America is buying less Chinese products. The prices are going up. The companies are getting hurt. Less is getting bought by you and me. Less is getting bought by people in China. So if less is getting bought, guess what? Less is getting made, right? And if less is getting made, what do we need to do? Not make as much, well, I just said that. Less is getting made, we don't need as many workers, right? So what are we asking for if this goes on long-term? Unemployment. Potentially, depending on how far this thing rolls and how important trade is to your economy, this can knock you in completely into a recession. Remember all these benefits of trade that we talked about two weeks ago? This is the opposite, right? We talked about the good thing about trade is that, you know, it, hopefully it overall creates jobs, lower prices, all that kind of stuff. But what are we getting with the trade war? 
you know, maybe, well, maybe the price of some products in America ends up being a little bit higher. Maybe the products of some prices in America ends up going less. It depends on a product by product prices. Some products in America are going to end up cheaper. Some products in America are going to get more expensive. But overall, prices might not move a whole lot. But what are we going to get? Job loss. Whoops. What are we going to get? Moving y'all ahead a couple slides. So this is what you're going to get with a tariff, with this trade war. The magnitude of which depends on how much that you're buying, how much that you sell. The other one I wanted to go back to is, if I can find it, this one. This scenario, bless you. Raising the minimum wage. Jacking it up from seven and a quarter to ten dollars an hour to eleven dollars an hour, fifteen dollars, whatever they're talking about. Whatever happens there. Well, that's good for you and I. Woo, we got more money to spend, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna spend at least 95% of it. Actually, our savings rates probably well, it's right now it's at a relatively healthy about five percent. Most of us spend about everything. So we're buying more. So that's going to be creating jobs, right? We're going to be buying more. But what's happening? The companies have to pay more for their workers. That slows down your ability to do stuff. So you're going to have companies that, I mean, it sort of, it depends. You're going to have a lot of companies that are going to end up laying people off. You may have some companies that are going to increase their sales, because it depends on what the nature of the product is, what they're selling. Let's say, who, describe, the people that typically are getting minimum wage or near minimum wage are who? Young people and undereducated people, right? So let's pick on young people. Let's just keep it simple and hopefully, I'm only offending y'all, not serious, seriously offending people. Uh, so the products that y'all buy, if y'all minimum wage goes up, that's going to be an increase in your paycheck, right? So y'all are going to be buying more Dr. Pepper. Well, Jenny was here. More Dr. Pepper, more Cheetos, more Fritos, more video games, more whatever it is that y'all buy. More drugs. You go, Preston. So the sales there are going to go up. So the people making Cheetos and video games and drugs, they're going to be coming out ahead. But what ends up happening, and we'll talk about this in 202, and actually I, we may get to it in this semester too, I can't remember, is, okay, if they bump the minimum wage up to $10 an hour, all those people making seven and a quarter are now going to make $10 an hour. But all those people making $8 an hour now, you're not going to raise them just to 10. They got to get raised past 10. Because I've been working here for three years, not wearing these pay raises to where I'm making $8 an hour, and now I'm going to get paid exactly the same as somebody that's been here for three weeks. So the $8 an hour workers are going to have to get bumped to, well, not to 16, but they, they wish, but they, they may get bumped to 1050 or 1075. But then those people that were making $9 an hour, they're going to get bumped up to 1150. But then those people that were making 950 or 10, they're going to have to get bumped up to like 12. But then guess what? Those people that were making $10 an hour, they're already above the line. Well, they got to get a pay raise too. And the $11 an hour people got to pay. So it's going to trickle up to just about everybody. And it might take six months or whatever for all of this, to, a year before all of it to filter through. But even if people are making $12, $13, $14 an hour are going to end up getting a pay raise there. Or they're going to get mad and quit. And you don't, with the companies don't want those people to get mad and quit because there's a reason why they were paying them that much money beforehand because they were their better workers, right? So, businesses are going to have to do pay raises for a whole bunch of people. And so it's a whole lot bigger impact than, yep, yeah, okay, McDonald's has got to pay more, so we've got to have more expensive Big Macs. But a lot of workers are going to get paid more. And so then there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to be sitting there and they're going to be, let's just pretend like Preston is like 35 years old. He kind of looks at all the drugs, they're like <laughs> burning him out. So. He's an older guy, and he's been working for me for a while, and I'm like, well, it's, bad. it's one thing I was paying him $8 an hour, but now I got to pay him 10 now I got to pay him 11 I don't think so, right? So it's going to be people like Preston, they're going to get let go. And Preston's an old dude. What was he spending his money on besides the drugs? 
Absolutely. Yeah, he's spending it. I mean, he's a real old dude. He's spending it all on health care and 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 and, and, and awesome. hair loss for men products and food, right. So what's going to happen? He's no longer making money. So the products that he would be buying, food, housing, that kind of stuff, are going to decrease. So there's going to be job loss in those fields, selling, making the stuff that people like him would be buying. So there's going to be jobs created, maybe making stuff y'all would buy, the jobs lost, making stuff he would buy. So what ends up happening when minimum wage comes through? Jobs don't really get created. You gain some in some places, you lose some in some places, but overall, guess what? We're buying about the same that we were before. We're making about the same that we were before. We just changed what it was. We got fewer real estate agents, more Cheetos makers. But what ends up happening with minimum wage? Price goes up. Because I'm like, okay, I, I was, you know, I, I was running a company and I was paying 10% of my money in payroll. Well, you know, if I if I got to pay my employees more, I'm gonna pass that on to my customers. I'm gonna jack my price up so that way I can keep making the same profit I was making before, right? So prices are going to go up. Businesses are going to pass that cost on. Generally, what you see over time when you look at all the minimum wages. There's been a couple times minimum wage increases actually caused a little increase in jobs. There's been a couple times in minimum wage increases caused a decrease in jobs. Overall, every time they've bumped up minimum wage, it's just been favor work. Yes. It wouldn't like if minimum wage got minimum wage got increased for like Amazon, then it wouldn't really affect anything because the guy Jeff whatever has so much money, it wouldn't it wouldn't affect anything. Would it? I mean. Okay, if like for big big companies, this wouldn't really affect anything at all. It absolutely would. Well, Amazon. Okay, you know, Amazon's got a ton of money. Yeah, they could afford to raise their workers, give them fifteen dollars an hour, and yeah, you know, Jeff has a lot of money. But Amazon, their profit margin is a lot thinner, and his money is in the shares of the stock that he owns of the company that he can earn around sell. So it ain't coming out of his pocket. What happens there? But Here's the, if Amazon raises their wages to $15 an hour, where are you going to apply for? Apply to everybody's going to apply to Amazon first. So then you've got that other store down the street, that Walmart down the street, that are like, we can't hire anybody because everybody's going to Amazon, and the only people that we can hire are the people that are too bad of workers for Amazon to work. So we're ending up with all of these dummies and leftovers and drug addicts named Preston. And so what are we going to so, are we okay with that? No. So what what Walmart gonna have to do? They're gonna have to raise their wages too. And so that's why it was two years ago now, I guess, a bunch of McDonald's workers in some places were like, well, we need fifteen dollars an hour, and they sort of started to the tipping point. For some of these other com companies, were like, well, they kind of a little bit had to too, and it's but luckily, luckily in quotation marks, had that that's more been in like I think like in New York and a couple of it hasn't gone nationwide, but it's going to spread like a virus once it happens and wages are going to be going up for everybody. And okay, Amazon can handle it. Walmart can handle it. But what about the gas station in Dundas? Well, there's no gas station in Dundas. <sighs> little country store, yeah. Yeah, the little country store there. When suddenly that little country store that has five customers come in a day and now they got to pay their teenage worker $12 an hour to be stocking the cooler and mopping the floor. Yeah. Yes. So it's going to end up having an impact. But like I said, some people are going to gain, some people are going to lose, and it just depends. But overall, for the economy as a whole, when you look at all 320 million of us combined, the total number of jobs, ain't that much of a difference. Some gain, some lose. Hopefully, you're one of those gainers. You got it. Hopefully, you are one of the people that you got to pay raise, and the products that you buy are becoming more affordable. Hopefully, you, you, you score, but... A lot of people, no. Uh, Sam, did you have your hand up first? There is a scenario where minimum wage goes up and the price stays the same. Isn't that like it happened in the 90s um, or the 80s? No, um, there, there'd have to be something else significant going on at the same time, not just the minimum wage. If you just look at minimum wage alone, the answer is no. But if you combine a minimum wage along increase along with something else like tax cuts. <coughs> if the government did a whole bunch of tax cuts at the same time, 
to allow the businesses to you get to keep more of the money that you got, well then you might end up getting a situation where the prices end up, well, down here, prices end up only slightly higher, but you end up actually creating jobs. But the government, they don't like cutting taxes. Yeah. Wouldn't inflation be like a big factor into um, the minimum wage raising thing? Because the more money is in circulation, the less that dollar bill is going to be worth. Yeah. This. <laughs> this that we're talking about is inflation. This is creating inflation. If prices are, and this is gonna sound weird, if prices are artificially low, that we'll talk about in chapter five. If prices are too low, well, this is one way to get prices up where they need to be. But if prices are already kind of high, the economy is already steaming along, you're just gonna be throwing gasoline into a fire that's already burning. You gotta be careful. And that's why, like in the 70s, you were talking about the 80s, whatever, back in the 70s, we had like inflation rate was already like 10 or 12%. The last thing they could afford to do is raise the minimum wage and throw gas on that fire. But everybody's like, but Derry, my paycheck won't buy as much as you said did last year because prices are 10% higher than they were before. There ain't no easy answer. I can't believe it. I was not at all intending to go here, but we here we are. Uh, this is part of why we're still only in chapter three, <laughs> but okay. But we're not that far behind. But the government, you know, they have to look at all of this stuff. They can't just say, well, we'll be putting money in the pockets of some people. We know we'll be taking money out of the pockets of other people. They got to look at the overall total complete impact. So, so will the government ever do an ex-cut in order to not have a recession? Um, yes. Uh, we'll get. I'll, I'm going to ask you to put a pin on that one until chapter eight, maybe. But the, yes, uh, it's chapter eight or maybe nine, somewhere up there. Um, a tax cut is a weapon to fight recession. In retirement countries, and there's a set of recession on that I do anything, not tax. Anything? <laughs> well, not literally. Anything. No, I wouldn't like well, what was it? Did Timon ask Boom to dress and drag and do the hula? You, you would do that? Get on national TV and dress no. uh, yeah. oh. Okay, good. Uh, I'm voting for you when you turn 35. Excellent. But uh, yeah, re recessions suck, but a recession is a depression light. Recessions, I mean, I mean, they suck, and we'll talk about them a little bit later on. But okay, let, 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 let me ask you: If you got a cut on your arm and you're bleeding, is that something you need to deal with? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, what happens if you're bleeding from your arm and you're bleeding from the neck at the same time? Are you going to be worried about what's going on with your arm? No. So that's the thing. You just, I mean, we, we would love to prevent the one problem, but you got, it, it depends on what's going on with the entire situation. You got to deal with one thing for the other. Cause I mean, ideally, well, you know, president Trump wants to prevent a recession. Well, then he's going to be trying to slow down this trade war, not though, not keep adding to the tariffs because he's playing the game of chicken with the Chinese government. He'd be trying to slow that down. But he's got other things in mind that he's looking to do. He's looking towards some of those other things, whatever the national security, we don't need to be as relying on them. And the whole, you know, this trade, he, he said, you know, the trade thing in the spheres, it should be, so we're losing jobs. So maybe we can get some of these jobs back if we do it because that, it ain't fair. What he's sort of suggesting is, um, let's see, this was the, uh, let me see if I can figure out in my mind. What he is suggesting is by doing this trade war thing, he's going to say that we're going to end up with, let's see, we're going to end up with this, we know, but he's hoping to do this. So maybe prices are higher. Maybe we don't lose so much. That's, that's kind of depressing. But that's a little, maybe. I've got to chew on that one a little bit. I can't think of. 
because demand is going to decrease, but he's thinking, the well, demand ain't going to decrease a whole lot because guess what? They ain't buying a whole bunch of our stuff to begin with, right? So by having this trade war, we're not really losing many customers in the hopes of, well, let me try this. He's actually hoping for three things. Oh, just, no, I'm sorry. He's hoping three things are going on. The tariffs are going to make things like steel and that kind of stuff more expensive for American manufacturers. But he's like, well, we're not going to lose a whole lot of demand because they ain't buying a bunch of stuff in the first place. But he's going to say, but we're going to end up getting an increase in supply in return because we're going to be making more stuff than we were making before. If you're looking in total, if you're not just talking about steel, but you're looking in total. So he's kind of hoping that you get a one, two, three punch. So you end up maybe with lower prices, maybe only a little bit lower quantity. Maybe if this goes out far enough, maybe you actually can increase. This is actually what he's hoping to get. He's trying to juggle three balls at the same time is what he's thinking. Well. Theoretically, that's what they're thinking in Washington, D.C. You're going to have three moves at the same time. The world is a complicated place. You're going to have a decrease in supply because some of our ingredients and stuff are going to be more expensive. We're going to have a small decrease in demand, but then we're going to have an increase in supply because we're getting more self-reliant and we're making more stuff out of We ain't buying Chinese socks. We've got an increase in the number of American-made socks. We're going to have an increase in the number of American-made TVs because we're making them ourselves because we ain't buying them from China anymore, right? So that's kind of what he's hoping is ship, 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 and we're going to end up here where we make more and hopefully prices end up lower. And then he's going to say, see, I'm a genius. More jobs to reelect me and watch old episodes of The Apprentice on Hulu or Netflix, whatever he's going to say. Right. That's the hope that he's looking for. But what's the results going to be? It depends. It depends. It depends. And you're going to have the people that are getting hurt, victimized during the transition. During the transition, you've got people that were growing soybeans that they were going to sell to China. Well, now they've lost their customers, so they got to quit making soybeans and figure out something that they can make that we as Americans are going to buy because we as Americans, we don't eat that much tofu and we don't use that much soy sauce on our food, right? So the farmers, just to use them, they can adapt quickly to this new reality. Assuming this is going to be the new long-term reality, the farmers that can adapt, or hopefully, will come out, hopefully, okay. But the farmers that can't adapt, Screw the producers making whatever Pepsi or making chainsaws or making film for cameras that y'all don't use anymore because digital cameras. No, those companies, if you can adapt, fine. If you can't, you're screwed. And the workers for those companies, if the company can adapt, woohoo. If the company can't adapt, you're hosed. Right? And so that's part of the thing. For any time the government gets into messing with our economy or whatever, they've got to be the lookout for. Yeah, we're, we're going to pull the trigger on this because we think more people are going to benefit than are going to get hurt. But you, they have to have an eye on, well, what can we do for those people that are getting hurt? Now, coming back to the slide, because I've teased it a couple times, and I've actually had it there. It's only good but this slide sums up what those last four slides were showing you. And if you cannot gang memorize this, well, I'll teach you the couple of rules that will help you figure this out if you have to rebuild this on the side of your test for taking the test. They both are going in the same direction. Up, up, down, down. It's quantity that changes. If one's going up and the other one is going down, it's going to be price that changes. So that's going to tell you which is moving. Now, if what direction is it moving? If demand goes up, you're going to get an increase for whatever it is. If demand goes down, you're going to get a decrease. So if you remember those two rules, both in the same direction, it's quantity, and if demand it's an increase, then you can rebuild this chart, and then you can use it to answer the questions like what would happen 
what would happen if the price of sugar goes up at the same time demand for Pepsi goes away? And I would be looking for quantity decreases. Right. That would be the answer for that one. So we have it. So bring reality into the test taking. So now I've talked about how well, the government can screw things up. The government can stick without messing with taxes and tariffs and all that kind of voodoo, there's other things that the government can do with the most perfectly, fantastically wonderful intentions. They mean well. There are some products out there that the government thinks is so important for society that we want to guarantee that they will be affordable. We're mostly talking food here. Things like milk, peanut butter, bread. We want to make sure they're affordable because peanut butter may be the only way that you can get a protein down the throat of a kid under the age of eight, right? So we want to make sure peanuts remain affordable so kids will eat peanuts so they'll stay healthy. We want to make sure milk is affordable so kids will be able to drink milk, get healthy bones and strong teeth, right? Strong bones, healthy teeth, however that phrase goes, right? So, to guarantee affordability, the government's going to set a price ceiling. They're going to set a limit to how high the price can go. Just like the ceiling is a limit to how high you can jump in this room. If you try to jump higher than the ceiling, you're going to end up with a headache, right? Now, when they create this ceiling, what ends up happening is if it goes into effect, they're going to create a shortage. But the ceiling is only going to happen if the equilibrium pr price is trying to go above the ceiling. I'm not getting a headache because I ain't jumping, right? Ceiling doesn't matter to me. I don't care if this is an eight-foot ceiling or if it's a ten-foot ceiling. This is an eight-foot ceiling in case you're curious. It doesn't matter because I ain't jumping. But if I try to jump more than nine feet, the ceiling is, becomes an issue, right? So if the price in the market because of our demand for the product, because of their supply of the product, if those forces start trying to push the price higher and higher and higher to where the price is trying to go above what the government says is too much. Say the price of milk is supposed to go up to $8 a gallon because we're, you know, the cost of cows is going up because a bunch of cows got swept away by tornadoes and stuff. And meantime, news is coming out that drinking milk makes you stronger, healthy, and bulletproof and that kind of stuff. So the price of milk is going up, 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 but the government says, ooh, you can't go any higher than this. So then we're going to go, hey, milk is cheaper than it should be. We're going to buy out all the milk, and then there's going to be no milk left, and we're going to be sitting there saying, give me milk or give me death, right? That's a shortage. If this thing kicks, ceiling kicks in, the government creates a shortage. If the ceiling doesn't kick in, nothing happens. If the government says milk should never go above, what is it, $6 a gallon? Eight. Okay. The government has a ceiling. Government says the price of milk should never go above eight dollars. Well, if you go to Walmart today and it's selling for four fifty, nothing happens, right? If milk is selling for six fifty, nothing happens. It only kicks in if the price of milk tries to go above eight dollars. So as long as it's less than eight, the government don't care. They say eight is enough. Sorry for you eighties TV fans. Eight is enough. But if it's selling for a dollar fifty cents, even better, right? If the ceiling is above the equilibrium price, yeah, if the ceiling is above the equilibrium price, nothing happens. But if the government, if this does kick in, producers are like, we're supposed to be selling our milk for nine and you're only gonna let us sell it for eight. You've created a shortage. You, the government, you, Uncle Sam, have broken something. Well, if the government breaks something, they kind of have this thing about, well, they kind of have to fix it. Because this is, for you visual learners, this is a shortage. We saw these shortages earlier. The price ends up being too low. The price is supposed to be, the price is supposed to be eight and, I mean, the ceiling is eight, but it's supposed to be nine. So what ends up happening? At eight dollars, they don't want to make as much as we want to buy at eight dollars, right? So this distance, that's a shortage. So what does the government do about it? Say, sorry, farmers, I know you want to sell it for nine, but screw you and the horse you rode, the cow you rode in on. No. The government causes this problem 
they're going to fix it. So what they're going to do to make this work is they're going to art ultimately artificially change things to where the amount of the milk that we want is the amount of milk that's going to get made. So what they'll do is they're going to encourage the farmers to make more. They're going to encourage pet or whoever the dairies to make more, to produce more. And the way they do that is they say, well, yeah, you're supposed to pay, it's supposed to be nine, but we're only going to let you sell it to the customer for eight. We're going to pay you the difference. You keep behaving as if the price was nine. You keep producing as if the price is nine, but you only charge the customer eight and we give you the difference. We're going to write you a check. How many gallons of milk did you make? Multiply that by what's the difference there and we write you a check. So the farmer doesn't matter. So the farmer doesn't care. I get eight dollars from you and a dollar from Uncle Sam. I still got my nine dollars. I got my nine dollars that I would have had if the government didn't mess around. But only eight comes out of your pocket as a customer. Eight. Yeah, the government. Where's the government get that dollar that they're paying the farmer from our tax money? So guess what? Any of you lactose intolerant? Don't drink milk. Okay, any of you that don't drink milk, we're going to pick on Luke because he's not here. Luke doesn't drink milk, but Luke pays taxes. So guess what? If this was to be kicking in, some of Luke's tax dollars would be going to make your pay, help you pay for your milk. Isn't that nice of him? Milk is expensive and he's helping you buy your milk out of his money. His taxes are higher because he, the government wants you to have cheaper milk. So give Luke a hug when you next see him. And then you can explain to him why. But freak him out first. Luke, don't cheat and watch this recording before people catch you and all like that. Luke, watch the recording. Keep up with class. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is going to help the producers to produce what they need to produce, get the money they need to stay in the business, and it keeps people to be able to afford products. Milk, peanuts, that kind of thing. I know I did take my sip. So you watch that. Um, so they're not going to do this for iPods or smartphones. No, they don't do iPods anymore. They're not going to do this for iPhones or computers or chainsaws or anything like that. They're doing it for, because this is the government breaking things and then we're taking money from people in order to pay other people so other people don't have to pay as much. The government is overly complicating things. So they ain't going to do that for just any little thing. It's just going to be those important, stable things that are just downright, fantastically important for society to be able to afford. And that's what I'm saying. It's food products. It's basic food products. It ain't going to be, what are it, Lunchables. It ain't going to be Lunchables. It's going to be peanuts, peanut butter, milk, that kind of stuff. The basics. But there may be products that the government says are so stinking important that we want to make sure they're always available. We never want people to run out of them. We always want people to be able to go into the grocery store and buy milk, peanut butter, bread, etc. So in order to make sure that it is available, the government is going to set a price floor, a limit to how low the price can go. Because they're going to say if the price gets too low, the farmers can't afford to produce the milk. The peanut growers can't afford to grow the peanuts that are going to get turned into Jiffy and Peter Pan and whatever the peanut butter uh, butters is, is, are out there. Right? Peanut butter, right? I don't know what's the plural for peanut butters. Peanuts butter, yes. Like attorney's general, yes. yes. So. They will set a price floor. This floor is limiting how low in that direction I can go. If I'm jumping up and down, I ain't going any lower than this floor unless I come out here with a jackhammer, right? So the floor is a limit to how low the price can go. Here again, if the price of milk is above the floor, let's say they set the floor at $2. If the price of milk is above $2, government doesn't care. Sealant, the floor doesn't kick in. But if the price of milk was to start dropping below $2 because all the cows in all the world start producing double the milk that they did before because of whatever it was that the aliens did when they flew over our planet and sprayed that stuff, you know who they were. And at the same time, they were all like 
But anyway, I'm just going to stop there. Um, so if the price of milk is trying to go below $2 a gallon, the government's going to say, we can't let that happen. Even if it's one ninety nine. Even if it's one ninety nine, they've got the limit. If they're going to let lot one ninety nine go, they go set the floor at one ninety nine. So they're doing this to guarantee availability. So this would be a situation where they say milk should not go below two dollars a gallon, and whatever market forces are saying milk should be only one. What happens there? The amount that we want to buy is more than we would buy at a dollar, more than we want to buy, more than they want to make at two dollars. Let's try, yeah, let, let me try this one. I'm, I'm going to take us into two steps. I crammed it all in one. The price, or the amount of milk that we want to buy at two dollars is less than the amount that we should be buying at one dollar. If the government would have left us alone, we'd be buying more milk because the price of milk would only be a dollar. So, price, so the government's forcing it to be more expensive, and what happens if it's more expensive? We drink less of it. But the government wants to guarantee affordability and availability. This was availability here, was the magic word here, right? Availability. They want to make sure we can get milk. And so how are they going to make sure we can get milk? By raising the price so we can't afford to buy as much? They can't do that. So what do they do is they say, well, we want the price of milk to be no lower than $2 a gallon. So they're going to sit there when they're with their little eyeball and they're going to say, well, at $2 a gallon, how many gallons do the producers want to make? And that's going to be this much. So they're going to say, well, if we want to satisfy demand and keep the price at $2, what we got to do is do something to create a new demand curve out here to where at two dollars a gallon this is how much we're going to make then this is how much farmers are going to make and this is how much it's going to get sold so what they did here is they have created a surplus they're trying to get the farmers to make more than the farmers are going to make otherwise So then they're getting farmers to, they're manipulating farmers into making more milk. And then what? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what happens is the government is going to say, well, we want these farmers to produce more to get, ultimately, I'm going to flip that backwards. We want the farmers to produce more in order to pull the price up to the $2 a gallon we wanted to be in order to get them to produce more. The only way they're going to produce more is if somebody buys it. So what's going to happen? We, the government, are going to buy that extra milk. We're going to go out into the market and we're going to buy milk. And as we're buying milk, as well as y'all buying milk, well, there's that many more people buying milk. It's y'all and Uncle Sam buying milk. So more milk is going to get produced, and that's going to be pushing the price of milk up to the $2 a gallon we want it to be. So the government is getting in the business of buying milk, buying peanuts, buying broccoli, buying whatever. Yeah, instead of writing them a check, they're going to, because we want to make sure it's available, they're going to pay the people to produce it because they, we don't want to like, well, we want you to plant this crop in the spring. And so we're going to say, well, don't, and we don't plant the crop. We're going to give you money. Well, what happens if a tornado or a hurricane comes through and tears up a bunch of the crop? So they want the stuff to be planted. And they're just going to be, when harvest time is coming around, and that's when the prices are going to get their lowest is at harvest time. And they're going to be looking around and they're going to say, ooh, the price is too low. Let's buy up some of this harvest. So then they're going to end up buying some of it. So then what do they do with this extra milk, these extra peanuts, this extra broccoli? Well, they kind of have people that they are responsible for feeding. People in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, the Coast Guard, people in prisons. You know, they've already got people they're buying food for. So what do you think they're going to do? Well, we, we got people we need food for, and we got food. Let's get the two together. You want to know what grew well last year? Look at what the army is eating this year. That's the way it rolls. They'll take some of the extra milk or whatever it is and they'll sell it to schools and hospitals at a cheaper rate. 
they'll give it away. Oh, if we have uh, whatever this super typhoon is hitting Japan or whatever here, like yesterday or today, whatever. And so, you know, a lot of damage and that kind of stuff. So there are people there that need food aid. Well, they need aid. Well, what are we going to send them? <laughs> well, we got this leftover food over here. Right? We're not going to start so going. We're, the U.S. government said people need food. We're, let's go to Walmart and buy some of these Lunchables and then airdrop it. No, not when we got this leftover food sitting here. Right? No, they're giving it away. They're giving it away. We bought it and we're giving it away. Or they'll sell it to school systems and hospitals for a cheap rate. But a lot of it, the, they're giving it away. Back in the day, Y'all are so young. Y'all parents probably don't remember the cheese truck, the government cheese truck. You like you okay. You know. Okay, you're familiar with it. What ended up happening is in, before food stamps, you were a low income family. Well, you needed extra food. Well, the government says you need extra food. We got extra food. The government was coming in and they pull up in the neighborhood and the dude to get out of the truck with a clipboard and you come up and if your name is on a clipboard, he's open up the back of the truck and handing you a box that's got some cheese and some milk and then peanut butter and that's what you got. But instead what we've done is we changed it food stamps instead of the government truck coming to you, we're giving you a coupon for you to go buy the stuff at Food Lion yourself. So we're letting Food Lion do the trucking, but by giving you the food stamps, what's happening? You're buying more food than you would have had without food stamps, increasing the demand for food, but just we ain't having government employees driving trucks around with clipboards, right? But that's the way they used to do it back in the day. We've got this food, you need food, shut up, quick complaining, I hope you ain't lactose intolerant. Here, have some cheese. So instead of the government buying the surplus, they're giving people money to prevent the surplus. Yes, it's part of the. That's food stamps, that's part of what it is, is preventing the surplus from happening in the first place by increasing the demand. So it's not just an anti-poverty measure, it's a making sure that these products stay available. And did you notice what I did? I used the exact same example for both, milk. All of these agriculture products have a floor and a ceiling. And I just pointed backwards. I'm <laughs> All of these products have a floor and a ceiling. They're gonna say, we want the price to be lower than eight so people can afford it, but higher than two so people can afford to make it. And as long as the price is in the middle, no problem. If the price gets too high or the price gets too low, we're gonna step in. Otherwise, no problem. And just about every agriculture product out there has a floor and a ceiling. And they, there's a lot of these things that they may never hit the trigger. They might only get triggered once every 10, 15, 20 years. Milk this year is $3, last year was $4, two years ago was two fifty. dollars What is year after year, somewhere between two and eight, the government may never kick in. There's some products that the programs kick in more often than others one way or the other, but you ain't gonna hit the floor and ceiling at the same time. But a lot of times, but the, there is the stability. Remember the eight economic goals and one of them was stability. That's what this is. Stability for households, for being able to buy the products without the surprise of I can't, they don't exist anymore, and I, but I can afford it. Stability for the producers to be able to stay in business, knowing that if things get too sideways, the government's going to help us out because the government knows that food is so stinking important. They ain't doing this for Nintendo Switches, right? Which, in a way, would be nice if they put a ceiling on the Switch, but we don't want a floor on the Switch, right? We don't want to switch on a floor either, right? Yeah, so you base that on the same value of life. Um, let's say milk is a floor, and then you got about the product. Oh yeah, you you'll have several products hitting their ceiling in a year, several products hitting their floor in a year, but no product is hitting them both at the same time. Milk you can't hit the ceiling and floor at the same time. It can't be above eight and below two at the same time. Not unless you're in a, yet another one of them alternate universes. These are cases the government is, would be messing around on purpose, messing with the economy, making the price be something other than the price would normally naturally be. But they're doing it, I dare say, for pretty good reasons. It's got to be affordable. It's got to be available. And so they're only doing it for things that got to be affordable, got to be available or not. It would be nice. It's got to be. Do I have, let's see, okay, no, I didn't, okay. Okay, I've already said this, you know, most products have both the floor and the ceiling, but only can be, one can be triggered at the same time. But I wanna go back a little bit. 
Let's talk about the price floor for a minute. What's happening here? Uh, the price should be, I don't know, a dollar to, let's say, 30. The price, the market forces, because of how much milk is being produced, the cost of producing it and delivering it, and all that kind of stuff, and our demand for milk, the price of milk should be a dollar, and at a dollar, we're drinking 30 billion gallons, whatever it is. But the government says, no, the price should be $2. At two dollars, how much would we buy? We would only buy like ten or fifteen. I'll just, fifteen is what I wrote. <coughs> so, if the government didn't get in the game whatsoever, if the government got out of the way, how much milk would get produced? Thirty. But what ended up happening when the government did get involved? How much milk got produced? By doing this price floor, the government ultimately caused an overproduction. If the government would have left things alone, the price of milk would have been a dollar a gallon and there would have been 30 million gallons made and we would have been drinking a 30 million, they would have made 30 million. Okay, yeah, a bunch of farmers might lose their jobs, but boom. But what ended up happening? By messing with the price floor, by messing with the economy, the government's causing more milk to be made than even you and I wanted in the first place which is part of why they're giving it away. So the government doing this is causing some waste. serious inefficiencies. What, what were you saying? Waste. Waste. Waste, inefficiency. Yeah, serious inefficiencies. Remember those eight economic goals? One of those goals was efficiency. The government is breaking it when they do a price floor. They're breaking it when they do a price ceiling. So they're causing stuff to be produced that apparently we didn't want to produce. Are they causing the price to be lower than it should be? And so they're paying people to not produce as much? There are times in price ceiling situation where the government would tell people, or price floor situation, they would tell people, stop producing. We'll just give you money. We'll give you money. We'll, we'll give you money. We bought all the milk that we need. We bought all the milk that we can get away with, we, that we can give away. We got milk everywhere we're just going completely nuts because of all the milk we have but we still need to be doing more so we're just going to pay you extra money to stay in the don't kill your cows but just don't milk them for the rest of this year well, don't because you got to milk your cows two three times a day so you go out you milk the cows and you pour the milk out in the backyard they pay from time to time they will pay people to milk the cow and pour the milk out if you if they took the if the government's paying you to milk it and pour it out and you say well i got this milk let me sell it you get in trouble with the government you go to jail for fraud. The government will pay people to not produce. Introducing inefficiencies. So the price will be about that much. And if it's at the same time, you try and sell it. Yeah. If you try, because you're, you're trying to sell something, something the second time the government has paid you. Instead of paying you to Paying you, they take delivery of it, and then they say, well, we don't need it, and they pour it down the drain there in Washington, D.C. Instead, they just have you pour it down your own drain. Or you just That's what they're doing, which is better for the environment, I guess. But if you're supposed to be pouring it out, and instead you're selling it to your neighbors or something like that, you get in trouble. Because you're not doing what they're paying for you to do. No women? Finally, we're done with <laughs> chapter three. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Anyway, just... I'm not going to sing the I Believe in Miracles song, though it is going through my mind, and this, this, nobody needs that. So, any questions, any other questions on this? Good, live, good lively discussion. Okay, so okay. the next slide is going to be on October 11th, it's going to be chapter three. Yeah, it'll be the second half of three, starting with supply, wherever we cut it off last week. So it could be three, and that's going to be four, five, and maybe the beginning of six. But I mean, a couple of the, Three was a huge chapter. A couple of some of these other chapters are a lot quicker. We actually get a couple chapters. We're going to be done with the entire chapter in a day or less. So, I mean, I think there's at least one chapter that's only got like six slides or something like that coming up. So, I mean, it's, so it ain't the number of chapters; it's the number of days worth of class material, and that's and so I, that's why I have them spread out and why I go by date, so it's an even amount of class material, even amount of days material per test.